Do you have a preferred pronoun, Doom? I, I choose to identify as a green chicken, yeah. <laughs> Welcome back to Futures Edge Podcast. I'm your host, Jim Urio. As always, the brains behind the operation, Bob Iacino, an executive producer. Today, we have a special guest. He's a green chicken. You know him as Doomberg, one of the most successful Substack writers uh, out there right now. And uh, he's doing something right because he has a bunch of followers and it's awesome. And he's a hero of mine. And I mentioned it before, if I had stayed anonymous on Twitter, probably would have saved myself a lot of headaches. Thank you for joining us, Doomberg. Appreciate it very much. Hey, Jim, Bob, great to be here. Looking forward to a fantastic discussion. Hope you guys had a great holiday and a good start to 2023. And uh, we Thank certainly you. have and, and looking forward again to uh, really getting into it with you guys today. Very cool. But before we start into the meat of things, we like to play a game, uh, the lightning round. We ask questions. There's five seconds that you have to answer. It's to establish credibility. You will be judged on your answers uh, aggressively. First of all, what's your favorite vacation spot? Uh, actually, Florida. Nice. That's a big state, specific. Uh, Fort Lauderdale. Okay, nice, nice. What's your favorite? Well, you, you're walking up to a bar. Let's say you're not an alcoholic. What's your favorite? What drink are you ordering 90% of the time? Spicy rum and 7-Up Zero. And I am a drunk. Okay. <laughs> Good, <Very> same. <laughs> Dogs or cats? And Do you have a dog? Uh, I'm a dog person, but we have a cat because my wife is a cat person and I'm yeah, voting we compromise for and do domestic tranquility. Wants, exactly. Sydney. Favorite movie and favorite actor. Yeah, what do you got? I got uh, swingers and Vince Vaughn in swingers. Those are, those are all very good answers. Yeah. The spicy rum and seven up or whatever that was. I may experiment uh, with that. I'll tell tonight. you what, seven up zero. You got to go with seven up zero. There's no sugar in okay, it. I'm not it sure like we have up. that at my bar. There's a ton of uh, sugar in spicy rum though, isn't there? That's why you got to go with the seven up zero. Trust me. All you'll taste is a seven up. You could mix that thing 50 50 and it'll go down like water. <laughs> That's dangerous. Okay. It's dangerous, right? Yeah, I'm always of the uh, mindset that your drink should never be really good tasting. I think that that's a recipe for disaster, but I'm willing to try anything. Well, let me know how you bourbon more, Jimmy. <laughs> okay, let's talk about energy policy. Um, you know, Bobby's a, an oil guy, I'm a more of a technical trader of energy. Um, we we on this show have taken massive swings at uh, the left's energy policy, um, vilifying fossil fuel the same week they tried to deny access to credit markets. And then they call and say, why aren't you pumping more gas? We think it is the most bipolar um, thing I've ever seen. Do you, are you on the side of us and explain? Yeah, I'd say broadly speaking, we're, on the, we're in this sort of pro-human, pro-energy uh, energy is life camp. And uh, one of the earliest pieces we wrote back when we were still a free newsletter was titled um, America's energy strategy is bonkers. And it got into everything that you were just talking about. Look at, at, at the highest level, your standard of living is literally defined by how much energy you get to waste. All humans everywhere um, want a higher standard of living. And if we're going to constrict the supply of energy, it necessarily follows that some humans somewhere are going to have to have a, a degraded standard of living relative to uh, what their current expectation is. And unless and until we get serious about energy and understand that you know, the amount of um, standard of living we can distribute across our society is wholly and totally dependent on the amount of primary energy we produce and the efficiency with which we distribute it. And so um, we're very much you know, pro-nuclear, pro-fossil uh, fuels in a responsible way, um, and ultimately, uh, if we're going to design our economy around the following equation, the, the total standard of living of all humans divided by our carbon emissions, there are smart ways to do that, and there are dumb ways to do that. And uh, we believe much of the environmental left and the progressive environmental movement are fundamentally anti-human. Um, they derive from Malthusian origins, and they actually would prefer there be less people on the planet. And that is their position, and they should just up and say it, because we suspect it would be a relatively unpopular one. But you're, I mean, you do think we should all immediately get rid of our gas stoves, right? I mean, that's just, that's just, common, right? <laughs> you know, it's funny. We put out a piece, first piece of the year called A Home Near You, where we made a bold prediction for 2023 that the left would attack um, gas furnaces 
and uh, that the words heat pump would be the environmental obsession for 2023. And boy, did they prove us right. And in a very short period of time, and the attack on gas stoves, let's be very clear, is just a covered attack uh, on your furnace. They actually want to get your furnace out of your home and they, they don't want any natural gas uh, going into your home. And so they've decided to concoct um, you know, these studies that allegedly claim that we're all dying uh, from various poisons because we've been cooking with natural gas all this time in our homes. Um, yeah. it's, going, it, it's, it's totally predictable. We were lucky in our timing. We, we kind of nailed it. Um, and uh, you know, we've been tweeting. Every time we see one of these propaganda type stories coming out, we've been retweeting it uh, with the phrase like clockwork. And that's just so that we can easily find all these stories when we write the follow-up piece, uh, proving how right we were in that in that original uh, publication we put out in early January. You know, it was interesting, Dunberg. One of the things I saw was that they were pointing to childhood asthma, and uh, the six hundred and fifty thousand, which statistically is just a huge, unbelievable amount versus three hundred and thirty million Americans. But <laughs> they said that uh, it, it's causing childhood asthma to a certain degree. And one of the things I did, I live in Florida. And there's literally no gas down here. Florida gas stoves, I mean, gas, uh, the gas company in Florida has about 350,000 clients in the whole state. And it's all electric stoves. So I looked at the childhood asthma in Illinois, where I'm originally from, which is like all gas stoves. And it was like 7.7% of the young population. And in Florida, it was 9.9. And I like, why do we have more childhood asthma here in the land of electric stoves? And then I looked into these, as you call them, crap studies, and it said the problem was ventilation. I I don't know. I mean, you know, if I suck on the the essence of banana for long enough, it's going to hurt my brain somehow. I mean, do you see these things as nefarious just in general? So, you know, I've been schooled in the art of of, uh, public affairs uh, in my time as a corporate executive. And uh, we used to have an old expression in industry called um, hazard equals risk times outrage. So your actual hazard as a corporation was the risk of something going wrong times the outrage if it did occur. And then as a follow-up to that, we used to say, there's nothing more outrageous than puppies and babies. And, um, and so as soon as I saw that they had decided to take um, childhood asthma, which who could be like, who's for childhood asthma, right? I mean, nobody's um, right. I'm, and I'm so the very, the very thing that you just did, which was try to argue the facts of the matter, seeds significant ground to the propagandists here, because as soon as you're arguing, you're putting people on the defense and saying, what are you for childhood asthma? How much risk do you want to take? How many child, how many, how many cases? I knew I was going to learn in this podcast. I knew it. (laughs) I mean, how many, how many um, episodes of childhood asthma are not, are are too many, you know, Um, we should, we should focus on zero. And we like to say zero. It saves one life. Right. Um, (laughs) Zero, zero is an emotional number. Um, So recognizing the tools of the propagandists, we're just not even going to get into the arguments about whether um, gas stoves cause, cause childhood uh, asthma. I mean, um, it, it's literally conceding important ground that need not be conceded. Go ahead. Jim. Just to put that one aside too, there's an NIH study, their own study that studied 500,000 subjects and said there was no correlation. But what really amazes me, and I, I said before, we're not, we're not uh, sponsored by pharma. If you want to look at pharma companies and products that may cause <laughs> problems, look at the prescriptions of Adderall for children, they've absolutely exploded up like 30% since 2017 alone, despite the fact that, because I always draw this um, connection between obesity that's happened over the last 40 years and nobody ever draws a line toward mental, mental illness, mental calmness, particularly in children. Why don't we hold them all accountable for that shit? You ever, does that ever cross your mind? So we do a lot of, this is thinking about um, obesity. Actually, I've never written about it, but there's a very fascinating uh, series of articles that we read. I wish I could find them again. Um, that links it to PFOS, you know, this uh, perfluorinated uh, organics uh, that uh, we wrote about in the Dupont Teflon uh, situation. And this pretty interesting study where there's, you know, it could be something like that. Like people have been trying to figure out why it is that we've become so obese for for many many years. But your broader point is uh, an interesting one, which is why don't we start big to small? You know, we got a fentanyl crisis opioid crisis in the country um you know this attack on on gas burning stoves like there's a very clear solution which is of course better ventilation but i again just getting into the argument and and the proposed solutions to it are actually just seeding important they want to stop natural gas from going into homes 
homes heated by natural gas that use furnaces are extraordinarily popular because it's really efficient. Uh, it works. Um, and, you know, if you live in a cold climate, you understand that you probably don't want to um, outsource the heating of your home in the winter to an electric heat pump. It, it, if you live in Minnesota, if you live in, you know, Montana, if you live in Michigan, if you live in Buffalo, um, you're used to heating your home in the way that you typically do. And, um, and this is intolerable to the environmentalists. And so, back to our original point, they have chosen the sort of hazard equals risk times outrage propaganda approach of pinning the use of natural gas and its continued use by consumers as directly causing childhood asthma. So that if you are opposed to their agenda of taking natural gas out of your home, you are pro asthma and children. <laughs> That's fantastic. Earlier, you said something that said, you said, unless we get our act together, as far as energy policy goes, we can expect you know a much different standard of living going forward. Can you elaborate on that? What constitutes getting our act together? And is it getting the environment and what's that office? I would say um, recognizing that there is no path to decarbonization without a massive, massive investment in nuclear energy. Nuclear energy is the safest, highest energy density. Uh, look, if, if we were going to do a massive rollout of nuclear power plants, I'd be all for installing heat pumps because I would know that the grid would be reliable. It would be there when we need it. We could electrify everything if we go nuclear. If we try to electrify everything and we fill the grid with intermittent solar and, and wind, I know what happens. The grid goes down just when you need it and you sit in your home shivering and everyone's standard of living is degraded. Look, your standard of living is literally defined by how much energy you get to waste. You cannot fight entropy without wasting energy. Disorder is spontaneous. We are not meant to be as ordered as we are a species and right angles do not uh, spontaneously exist in nature. Your home is filled with right angles. It's heated. You have to upkeep it. Uh, walk away from your home for a year and see what happens. Um, and so ultimately, unless we get serious about producing high energy density energy, starting with nuclear, supplemented by fossil fuels. Um, I do actually have a soft spot for solar, which we can talk about. But broadly speaking, the solution to human emissions exists. It's called nuclear power. Um, the nuclear waste canard is exactly that. It's a canard. We know how to handle it. There are no solutions in life. There are only trade-offs. And amongst the trade-offs available to us, so, having, it, it. Having, having everybody have a high standard of living and we deal with nuclear waste is a pretty good deal. Okay, but what, what are the, before Bobby, for the next question, what's the likelihood we actually start down that path in a responsible and reasonable way? Not until we've experienced enough pain. So again, we will eventually get there because we have to, because the human spirit is strong and everybody wants a higher standard of living and everybody wants to take care of their family. Um, we will tolerate an enormous amount of political incompetence until it hits home. And that's why the name of that piece on heat pumps was called The Home Near You, because everybody who has a furnace that is powered by natural gas is in the target of the environmentalists. And so you need to know that this is quickly coming to a home near you. California has already banned um, the installation of new furnaces post 2030. And in the piece, we made, a, we made a joke that like, so we, we wrote a whole piece about who was going to benefit. And believe me, private equity guys are all over this already. The first group of people that are going to benefit are furnace repair technicians, because the definition of what a new furnace is is going to evolve. We, we likened it to mechanics in Cuba after the sanctions were put in place who were able to wrench on vintage cars. Like they kept those cars going for decades. You're going to see the same thing uh, with furnaces. But more seriously, HVAC companies are being rolled up right now by private equity. And you're going to see massive price increases, local monopolies. And ultimately, it's going to be the consumer that pays. You're going to get an inferior product that costs you more, that fails you just when you need it. And thanks to your local politician, um, you're going to be doing that in the name of saving the planet. So it's interesting that you mentioned the uh, the uh, HVAC guys. Uh, we did a podcast with Luke Grom, and, and we actually ended up titling that podcast, uh, Mechanics Are Going to Make More um, Than Investment Bankers in the New Future, because of that sort of physical transition. I also think it's super interesting, and I want to make a point of it, where you said there's no right angles in nature, because... I don't know if you're familiar with Brett Weinstein and his wife, Heather Hang. Yes. Um, I read their book, A Hunter Gatherer's Guide to the 21st Century. And that's the first time I heard that, is that our minds are actually affected by living within right angles. Yes. Because it just kind of takes you to this idea that there, there needs to be order. And we're not a creature that accepts order very easily. So I, I just want to compliment you on that. I read your um, sub, sub stack of Time for Choosing. It's one of my favorite ones. And in there, 
And I'm kind of asking your advice here because early in this podcast, you said you can't engage them in the facts. So I kind of want to approach every environmentalist that I think is talking crazy, for example, gas stoves, uh, by saying, are you pro-fentanyl? I, I mean, is that kind of what we're talking about here? You put in a time for choosing while these same organizations have worked hard to distance themselves at least superficially from their ugly, historic physics mandates that full implementation of their policies would result in death of countless human beings in the name of preserving nature, to which we routinely say to the closet Malthusians who support such thinking, you first. I, I mean, that seems to me to be the only way to talk to these people, say, fine, I'll do it, you first. Right, so my point is, once you engage on, when they make up a fact and you try to rebut it, to the uh, non-expert who's listening, suddenly it's a debate and there's a 50-50 chance. You see, so I'm not going to debate whether natural gas stoves cause childhood asthma, because that's actually the point is provoking that debate to make you put you on your back foot. I'm going to go on my front foot. Um, how much would you like the average American to degrade their standard of living? And how would you decide um, who has a high one and who has a low one? Like, ultimately, um, it, it's very clear. Like at CBS just had this Paul Ehrlich, who's a, a, a total Malthusian, um, who literally believes there should be far fewer people on the planet than exist today. Okay, who 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 goes first? Um, we start with piece, them. Yeah, but we we start we pro, we put a piece out um, a couple of months ago called Malthusian Malarkey, and you know some of the history of this. Now look, time passes, and what's acceptable to say in public discourse changes. But when you go back and you look at the the origins of the Sierra Club and Greenpeace and all of these organizations, that they were fixated on what was called the population explosion. And there's literally a book out there called Too Many Asians, okay? Wait, and, what? Yeah, and we profiled this in our piece. And the book was reviewed in the New York Times, just, oh to, give you, just to give you a sense of it. Like the, the hordes of, of people who don't look like us are going to monopolize the world's assets and the world's resources, and there won't be enough quote for us. Like that's where these people come from. They pretend like, and look, not everyone who's an environmentalist today believes that, but they are formed and their opinions are formed by people who do. Paul Ehrlich is prime example number one. Like he literally, um, he, in one of his books, he praises two um, uh, pioneers of eugenics. Like these people want less people on the planet. In their mind, Alex Epstein does a great job of characterizing this in his books. In their mind, all humans are basically a cancer on quote nature. Well, not all, because I don't think they count themselves on that. But once we have too many humans on the planet, we become a cancer on nature and our very being is what they're objecting to. And so that's fine. Like you could argue that. And there are people on Twitter who argue with me about it all the time. Just be honest about it. If you would like one fifth of the number of people on the planet that exists today, how are you going to go about choosing the four fifths who do not have a right to provide for their families, to leave their children better off than they found themselves, to you know, progress as humans? Um, they would like less of you. Let's be honest about it. The, the thing that offends me is the sleight of hand uh, where they try to pretend like there's an easy path where everybody has abundance and the, and the population is going to, uh, the, the, the plan is going to be just fine. Um, I, ironically, there is one and they're opposed to it, which is nuclear power, and they're opposed to it uh, precisely because it gives cheap abundant energy to the masses and they think that is a nightmare. And so in the piece that you refer to, A Time for Choosing, this whole um, hype cycle around fusion is That's terrible. That's where I wanted to go next. Yeah, it's terrible because we have the answer today. It's called fission. And what the environmentalists will do is that they'll oppose all fission now and say, just wait for fusion. And then when fusion's finally ready in two decades, they'll concoct a reason to be against it and it'll never be implemented. Um, and so we, if we are truly serious about carbon emissions, the, the simple answer is nuclear power. We could do it. China's doing it for example, for all of their dominance of the renewable energy supply chains, they have 150 nuclear reactors at various stages of uh, design and construction. Like, do, look what they're doing, not what they're saying. Um, and so as long as, like, I, my argument is to just put them on the back foot. Like, how many humans would you like to remove from the planet? And how would you decide about uh, who, who goes first? It's interesting because I, I am old enough to remember a time, I want to say it was the 80s and the 90s. You guys tell me if you remember this as well where the environmentalists were pushing natural gas. They were actually pushing it well, as a replacement for 
heating mm -hmm. oil in homes and to a certain degree gasoline. They were trying to get nat natural gas powered vehicles. Am I making that up in my head? No, it seems like that step up to getting rid of all of it is sort of the path. I'm, I'm all for natural gas replacing coal and especially heating oil in the Northeast, which is really just a consequence of unions. Look, there's 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 problems with all sides, right? I mean, the, the Northeast is burning diesel in people's homes basically because diesel truck drivers are unionized. I think that's a terrible policy. I think it would be fantastic to upgrade their homes to natural gas powered furnaces. Um, I don't think that upgrading their homes to uh, heat pumps is probably going to be very wise, given the fact that they tend to struggle when you need them the most, which is when it's the most cold. And also, in the Northeast, their electricity grid can't handle <laughs> in, in, extra electricity. They won't, you know, at the last cold snap, 40% of the electricity in ISO New England was coming from the burning of oil because they have sh proactively shut down their nuclear power plants and they're replacing them with intermittent solar and wind. And in the winter, the sun doesn't shine and sometimes the wind doesn't blow. And just a fact. And so um, I would be much more sympathetic to the propagation of heat pumps if we were also building out nuclear power reactors and grid interconnections. You know, the state of Maine voted down uh, a, a new um, transmission power line to bring hydropower from Quebec into New York. Like the NIMBYism is very, very strong. Um, and so oh, what's NIMBYism again? I've heard uh, the not, word before. What not, is it again? Not in, not in my backyard. Oh yeah, I got it, got it, got it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so. you before mentioned solar, which I thought was was interesting because, like, what what future does that have? Do you think that that's something that's going to play an important part, or could it play an important part? I think we should always be investing in the development of solar technology for the following reason: um, every day the sun bombards the earth with orders of magnitude more energy than we could ever hope to harness and use or need. And the allure of being able to harness the sun, because the earth is not a closed system, of course, and the sun powers everything and oil and gas, you know, uh, if you believe the sort of origins of oil and gas are nothing more than sort of stored solar power from eons ago. All the food we eat, um, uh, the, the wind energy, uh, the tidal waves, the, the entire earth is driven by the sun, of course. And so um, because the sun just bombards us with all of this free energy, um, if we could figure out a way to both harness it and to um, remove its intermittency, in other words, to smooth out the amount uh, that is available to equally match demand and run our grids in an efficient way, um, I, I think solar far more than wind um, holds out the promise um, that we could someday truly have um, you know, carbon-free power without any sort of uh, negative consequence. Now that technology does not exist today. There's many, many challenges with solar. Um, but I do believe that, you know, I, I own solar panels. I, I, I handle them often, I, especially for sort of off-grid, you know, and when I'm out camping or, or you know, out, out at the lake. Um, it, it, it's, there's, a, there's an allure there and it's real and we should be investing in it. Um, but for now, we do have a solution, which is nuclear power. And, and, you know, we, we can handle the waste. And so it's, it's the thing that's frustrating about the whole energy debate is it's not a technology race. Um, it's not even an economic issue. It's a political one. So here's a classic example. Environmentalists will do everything in their power to sue, slow, postpone, make regu regulations uh, oppressive uh, against nuclear power. And then on the other hand, they turn around and say, nuclear power is too expensive and takes too long. So it shouldn't be part of our energy solution. Well, it's too expensive and it takes so long because they made it that way. And then they turn around and argue against it for something that they did. Um, we could do it. China's doing it. It's totally possible. The technology exists. There are no real barriers. Go ahead. Okay. When you, when you see what Sri Lanka did, you know, banning um, synthetic fertilizers, Netherlands did something similar. Canada uh, talked about it too. Like, this is more about psychology. Is, does that, is there a moment where they overplay their hand like they did in Sri Lanka where all the people were like, what the hell's going on? And the uprising happens. Do, does, that, does it have to happen that way where they just make too many mistakes and people go crazy? Uh, it feels like, so we like to say on the path from abundance to starvation is riot. Um, people will riot. And um, unfortunately, well, I should say, fortunately for the people of Europe, it has been a really mild winter. And it looks like they may be they may be able to escape the worst of the consequences of their energy fiasco. Uh, 
the unfortunate part of that it is, is that it looks likely that the leaders of Europe are set to learn all the wrong lessons from this. And they will take a rolling of a dice and a lucky outcome as proof of the soundness of their policy, and they will double down on it. And the one time that it comes up snake eyes, I think you're going to see significant calamity. Um, I hope it doesn't happen. We have many thousands of subscribers in Europe, and um, we have many friends in Europe. I love Europe. Um, I love Europeans. I love the people of Europe. I think they're terribly poorly led. Um, and 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 unfor you know, unfortunately, it looks like their political leaders are learning all the wrong lessons. A very key milestone that you and your listeners and your viewers should be keeping a close eye on is in April, Germany is scheduled yet again to shut down its last three remaining nuclear power plants. If it does that, then ultimately, what happens to Germany after that is on them. Like it's hard to feel sympathy for people who shoot themselves in the foot and wonder why they have to, uh, why, why they're walking with a limp. Um, and so, you know, we, we shall see if, if they keep those power plants back uh, up and running, at least they have some sanity. They were sane enough to do it through the winter. Um, and luckily they've been blessed with mild weather, but let's see what happens going forward. So two questions, Doomberg. One is based off of what you just said. If you could get uh, the German population in a room, what would you be telling them to do? Would you be telling them to vote these bad ideas out? Um, because I honestly, when I look at German elections, I, I don't see anyone with that strong of a position uh, with, with correct positions, to be honest. It seems like they have oftentimes options between dumb and dumber. The uh, propaganda is pretty thick in Europe in general and Germany in particular against nuclear power. And so, unfortunately, um, it, it doesn't seem like you're going to have substantial political change without substantive popular pain. Right. Like you need to feel the consequences of your bet, viscerally feel the consequences of your poor decisions Gosh. before you are shocked into action. And yeah. and so then you're stuck with this catch 22 again. Like I, I, I we're not sitting here cheering for a cold snap in Germany so that we could somehow feel validated about our predictions that Germany had put itself in a bad spot. Germany spent a half a trillion dollars to buy every freaking BTU of energy they could find, regardless of cost or carbon footprint. They're burning coal at record play you know that they're one of the dirtiest grids in europe like if this is victory um i mean have at it but at the same time they have escaped major pain which means lessons won't be learned which means we're just going to repeat this all over again heading into the winter of 2023 and i would and, say that as an active trader the worst thing you can do is be rewarded for bad behavior which it seems like is what's but what happens with traders when they um when they buy uh deep out of the money calls and there's a takeover the next day and they think that they're a genius what do they do yeah, they, they roll it into the next one and then they lose all their money right right, right, right. and so that's the exact great metaphor for what i believe the european leaders are going to do they're going to basically take the lucky winnings of a yolo option play <laughs> and they're going to roll it down into the next one because they think it's it's validation of their genius and not just uh, a lucky outcome. You know, there's an expression in science called the expected value. The expected value is the is the probability of an outcome times the consequence. They got lucky with the weather. That was a low probability event, so they avoided big time consequences. But actually, the decision should be measured by the expected value when it was made. It was reckless when it was made. Yeah. They got lucky. That just means they're going to be reckless again. And as you know, as a trader, the same thing that could happen, you're going to go short something and there's going to be a takeout the other way and you're going to be stuck, right? I mean, so it's a fantastic analogy. These, these politicians are basically YOLO traders who got lucky in an options play and they look set to double down and triple down again. And we, we both know how that ends. Yeah. When we, uh, when we look at traders, we look at risk reward and a K ratio, which is kind of a simpler version of what you just said. But the second question goes to your Rubicoin uh, sub stack that I think that was the middle of December. I might be sure. wrong. Yeah. That. Crossing the Rubicoin. Crossing the Rubicoin. That piece was awesome. And rather than try and ask you a poorly worded question where I'm paraphrasing what you already wrote, what's your opinion of, of Fed digital currencies and the sort of outlook of that space in general? Yeah, so the social preview for that piece, if I remember it, is um, central bank digital currencies will basically soak up the last vestiges of personal privacy, and they should be vehemently opposed. Mm -hmm. um, central bank digital currencies are the ultimate Trojan horse of government interference in your life. And uh, private, uh, the expectation of privacy is not a disease. It's not, um, it's not something to be uh, scorned. Uh, humans have a fundamental right to privacy. And uh, ever since 9-11, the ongoing continuous encroachment 
and, this, and the buildup of the surveillance state is real, undeniable, and has deeply negative consequences for human freedom. And um, I, I, I don't care what anybody says. If you, you, you should be pro-freedom. Um, the government is not your friend anymore. Uh, the government uh, only knows how to do one thing, grow and control. And, and the U.S. was not set up to have a surveillance state and a federal government that is 30% of GDP and unaccountable uh, politicians who gerrymander their, um, the, their districts so that effectively they can't ever lose. And they stay in politics for 30 years and they enter politics broke and they leave politics centimillionaires. That's not how the system is supposed to work. The system is broken and we should fight to fix it. It's worth fixing. Um, and central bank digital currency is the last. We think you're in a canoe going over Niagara Falls. Uh, once we have central bank digital currencies, the government will see everything you do, will be able to control it, um, that they're going to implement it next time there needs to be a stimulus. If you want your $10,000 stimmy, you got to go sign up at fedcoin.com and give them all your personal information. They'll give you the sugar high of the 310 grand. And then next thing you know, uh, Bobby's going to get an email or a text message from fedcoin that says, Hey, Bobby, you know, you kind of drive a lot of miles this month. I don't think you should be allowed to buy gasoline anymore. And, and, you know, you probably had a little bit too much sugar and, you know, if you become obese, <laughs> That's going to affect the uh, Medicare system. So you've bought your calories for the month. We're going to go ahead and, and uh, stop all transactions on Fedcoin that um, that allow you to to, to buy uh, high carb food at the grocery store. And then, oh, even better, um, your carbon footprint, Bob, and uh, you know your friend Jim is pretty pretty bad too. You, you're not allowed to travel to, uh, to to New York this week because you've already taken two flights this year, and your carbon footprint has exceeded your allowable budget. Uh, a budget which will, of course, shrink uh, over time. And so you can say that I'm a conspiracy theorist or that this is whack or that this is out there. A, a BS. This is coming. This is the intent. It's not a conspiracy theory. It's a fact. And we better better fight it now or you're never going to be able to fight it once it's here. That's already happened in the world with the Catholic Church. For <laughs> That's what I was going to say, the exact yeah. same thing. It's not a conspiracy right. at all. It's real. You go, Bobby. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, I mean, it happened with the Catholic Church with don't eat meat on Fridays and you can only eat fish. Mm -hmm. I mean, it happened so long ago. Those of us that were brought up Catholic, I consider myself a recovered Catholic, lived it. But my mother still to this day won't eat meat on Friday. She eats fish. And that was because of the decree from the Catholic wow. Church, which is basically bought by the fishermen. I'll give, I'll give you a modern version of it. Look what China did with the COVID. Um, uh, That's uh, what I was talking the, about. The COVID yeah. codes and, and on your phone. Like you can't even get into your apartment complex because they've decided you protested too much. I went to, I consider myself a recovered Catholic, but I went to my Catholic upbringing. You guys are being much, I, I'm clearly still struggling with being raised a Catholic. <laughs> Go ahead, but, Jimmy. Well, but Canada, yeah. no, Canada did the same thing as well, too. Um, you know, looked at people's bank accounts who donated money to the trucker strike. I mean, there's, if the people, this is going to be my question is how do we get people to understand what's happening and fight this fight with us? This is the most frustrating thing ever. Is there a path? I don't know if there's a path, but I would say I intend to leave this earth with my head held high, knowing I did what I could. Whether I'm successful or not is, is not relevant, because if you're focused on the aggregate impact of your individual behavior, um, then you've lost. I'm going to okay. set an example for my kids. I'm going to write. I'm going to use my platform. We wrote a piece on Justin Trudeau and his dastardly behavior against the truckers called Just Watch Me. It was one of our favorite pieces. It went viral, several hundred thousand reads. You know, uh, his father tried something similar. I'm not sure how much, how well you know Canadian history, but um, Justin Trudeau's father, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, um, had similar uh, dictatorial tendencies, let's say, and actually called in the Canadian army on Canadian citizens famously. And he gave an interview to the CBC um, where he ended the interview saying, you know, just watch me when the reporter was sort Jeez. of aghast at the and we we include a link to that in our piece. I'll send it to you guys when we're done recording. Um, but at least Pierre Elliott Please. Trudeau had intellect and charisma, right? Like the guy was probably more dangerous, but he, he was a popular politician and he had charisma and he had intellect and he was willing to stand yeah. up and, and debate it. Justin Trudeau has none of those things. This guy's born on third base and oh. thought he heard a triple. Um, you right. know, like just when when guys like us look at him, all all he smacks of is wanting a punch in the face. And I'm not suggesting punch yeah, in the face. That's going to be a non but, I am. but just from the beginning, you know what I mean? It was like unbelievable. And so what he did never seen anything like to it. his citizens and the the Canadian media establishment and their treatment of those 
of those peaceful demonstrators, the Canadian media establishment in particular should be ashamed of itself. I mean, what happened there was deeply, deeply dangerous, set an incredibly terrible precedent. Uh, it's still reverberating in the G7. Like this cannot be normalized. Like, by the way, I, we believe, and it's a piece we've been thinking about and sort of writing, but haven't yet published. We need a digital bill of rights for the online world. Like it cannot be that the government can freeze your access to online banking without any recourse, uh, without any, any, any cause, uh, just because they happen to be protesting uh, against the, the sitting government. Like, what does that mean? Like, and once the government has that control, which Trudeau took arbitrarily, um, then all bets are off. Like you no longer have a free society. And so then people will say, well, you know, um, if you have nothing to hide, what do you care? Yeah, okay. I mean, that's, that's a very, very, very slippery slope. Uh, very soon they're going to say, well, you know, you don't, you know, back to the point earlier, like your carbon footprint, how much sugar you've had, uh, how much vice you've had. Um, it's already happening in the U.S., by the way. There's, uh, the, the progressive has the progressive movement has understood the power of the payment processor. And so, for example, um, they fought very hard to get uh, gun sales and bullet sales into a separate category with Visa and all the payment processors, PayPal, pick your favorite. Now they have a point source of attack. They don't process uh, the purchases of guns, legal or otherwise, right? I mean, um, or bullet sales, uh, pick your favorite. Like they've realized that money is power. Um, but as we wrote in, in Crossing the Rubicon, money is not actually a public good, it's private good. Um, and, and if we seed money as a public good to corrupt governments, um, or even if the government today that takes that power is not corrupt, eventually it will be replaced by one, and the temptation to corrupt it will be irresistible. And so, um, but back to the original question, all you can do is advocate for the policies in the way in which you know how to be a law-abiding citizen to participate in the uh, discourse and to do your best, leave a record that states that when it was being debated, you were on the right side of history, you tried your best, you did your best, and you died proud, proud of what you did. Um, and, and we think long and hard about the fact that our kids are gonna be able to read every single Duberg piece that we write, right? And we wanna make sure that 15 years well, from, I, we, we stand by know, and not to. Right. Not to be a name dropper, but I, you, Larry Kudlow and I have been together in media for 15 years. And he was, we were talking on his radio show and he was all depressed about everything and everything. And I said, well, there's one thing that's, that's a beauty here. And I think it's kind of echoing what you're saying is that in the past, we libertarians, right-leaning conservatives, whatever you want to call me, we, we had this question mark in our head. Are we hundred percent right about this shit? Now we know we're 100 percent right about it. We saw it. They gathered up their steam and they've come after us. We were right the whole time. But that's kind of what you're saying as well, right? This is a golden time to be a conservative or whatever we are. Well, again, if you take your favorite uh, moments in history, um, when we read history and we read about people who stood up to corrupt regimes and ultimately paid, you know, the ultimate price, uh, we view those people as heroes. We're nowhere near paying that kind of price. You know, I had my Twitter account deleted. I mean, okay, big deal. But um, but still. Um, if you have a set of principles and you have a set of values and you live by those principles and values, at least you can rest well knowing that you left a track record of, of, of those principles and values for the people that come after you to see. Uh, my children are going to read Doomberg in 20 years and I'm not, I'm not going to be ashamed of one piece. Um, that's, that's my goal. And as long as I do that and I speak my honest beliefs, and by the way, totally open to being having my mind changed based on a new set of facts and a new set of data. Um, but by and large, using physics as our guideline and physics actually doesn't change that often. Physics is not very political. Um, I'm a PhD scientist. I'm very well trained in physics. It's the core of what Doomberg off offers to our clients, which is our subscribers, which is we will explain non-financial topics to finance professionals in a language they can understand. Um, guided by physics, we will hold our head high. We will fight the good fight. And if we win or we lose, we know that we we put in our time. We did our effort, uh, and we did right by our readers and and ultimately by our children. So, two part question, Doom. I'm, I again, I'm a subscriber to your uh, your Substack, and I, I generally lean toward the more sort of energy and financial pieces. Um, did you guys take a stance on vaccines versus natural immunity at all, number one? 
And then number two, I, I heard you describe yourself as a humanist at the beginning of this. So I see you as a political, correct me if I'm wrong on that. And is there somebody on the left and on the right that you could look at and say, okay, I can get behind these people? So to your first question, we have not written about the vaccine situation and we have not written about the vaccine situation by design okay. um, and for the following reason. Uh, I'm not trained in the area of science that would be necessary for us to make an intelligent um, assessment of the situation. Um, and as a rule, if we're not going to write about it, we never tweet about it, which is a great rule for existing on Twitter. Like if we would never write about something broadly, we don't tweet about it. Um, I personally got vaccinated, um, two shots, and then I decided not to get boosted based on the data that I saw. Same of and, I, and I suspect here, by the way. that I'm an, uh, sitting in a very popular group uh, of people. Um, at the time, um, the, the vaccines were seen as a way out of the lockdowns. Um, I participated, I, you know, followed the government orders and stayed in my home. And luckily I have a business that, that, that is amenable to um, you know, working from home and, and remote work. Um, but our business suffered substantially from that, from the COVID lockdowns, as I've explained in other contexts that we have a consulting business. We lost 85% of our business in the span of six weeks in the, in the late winter, early spring of 2020, we had to reinvent ourselves and we did. And that's how Doomberg was born. Um, and I think, you know, the American spirit or the, you know, the human spirit globally is, is strong and can rebound from such things. But, um, I do not have one of the things that I, that we try to do as a team is if we don't have a differentiating set of expertise to offer, then what are we doing engaging on the topic? Mm -hmm. And uh, I've certainly observed the debate. I have my views. I have my opinions. I see the sort of propaganda techniques that are red flags for me. But because I can't definitively say, like I can in energy, what's right and wrong in the vaccine space, we've decided to stay away from it. And look, <clears throat> we could have jumped on that bandwagon and grown our audience two or three times. Um, we decided not to because we'd rather be as right as we can be, not as big as we can be. So, so I'm not so sure I'm sorry, if there's any... Just, if I could remind you of the second no, question, is there anyone sure. on the left and or the right oh, yeah, yeah, that's you a could great theoretically question. get yeah. behind? Theoretically. Yeah, no, I actually, I could get behind lots of people on both sides, I think. Um, I'm just trying to think. Like, I, So we're pretty apolitical because we're pretty down on the current state of politics. Right. Um, and so I hesitate to say, obviously, <clears throat> big supporter of, of Ron Paul, and I think that he has been probably the most consistent politician in the history of American politics. Uh, we're students of political history. Um, you know, I, I think JFK, for example, was a great politician and history is written by the winners and he was a loser, right? I mean, they they shot him and and uh, they have sullied his history. Um, and, and as we've written in a prior piece, I think Lyndon Johnson is one of the most dastardly characters in the history of US politics. And we could trace much of the, of the decline of US politics to when Johnson uh, ascended to the presidency to replace Kennedy after his assassination. You know, then we went to war and we had the, the protests and we had the, the deficits and then Nixon was forced to take us off the gold standard and we had the inflation of the 80s and, and so on and so on. And so um, if I look at the political landscape today, unfortunately, there are precious few <laughs> authentic people that I could get behind. And so I'm kind of like disengaged. So I, I can't give you right or left politicians today <clears throat> that I would get behind other than to say, I admire Ron Paul's consistency and I admire his prescience. And, you know, at his ripe old age, he's still going strong. Um, and he, like we mentioned earlier, will leave an unblemished track record of how he believed and how he behaved uh, for his legacy and for his uh, children and grandchildren to see. And, and interesting. That, I asked for proud. on the left and on the right, and you basically delivered someone I consider to be a centrist. So I guess you answered yeah. the question perfectly. Yeah. My my last question, and then Bobby, if you want to, we'll wind it back to you know oil, and so we can pretend this is a market podcast. Whatever you want to do. <laughs> my last question, my last question is this: is that you just talked about complying at the beginning three years ago, and I'm not sure this is a valuable exercise to to rewalk our steps, but I, I hope it is, and I do this all the time. I myself think I would do things different because I got the one Johnson Johnson vaccine. I locked down for a couple of weeks when they told me to. If you had to do it all over again, would you be as compliant or have you changed? 
Well, I think a better question is how will the population behave, not just me, the next time they try. Right. I, I trust it. Yeah, sure. Uh, like I look, I mean, it. it so um, I was fooled by the videos coming out of China of people collapsing on the streets. Look, I'm a prepper, first of all. So I am susceptible to such propaganda because I love my family very deeply. I love my friends very deeply. And I went into prepper mode. When I'm sitting on Twitter and I'm watching, you might not remember this, but there were like all kinds of videos going viral on Twitter of people just collapsing in the street. Oh, I remember, yeah. And there were all kinds of reports about cremations and sulfur in the atmosphere from the burning of humans. And, and the thought at that time was that this disease was way worse than was being let on. And so I proactively went into lockdown because I'm a prepper and I love my family and I wanted to protect my family from what I thought was something that was worse. I fell victim to that propaganda. Um, and by the way, no apologies. I would do it again. Like I, I, I'm, if presented with the risk that my children and my wife and my friends um, would be put in peril, I will act in the same way that I did. And that, of course, is a widely known human phenomenon that propagandists use for their own benefit. So I would tell you that I'm a protect first, ask questions later guy. And the next time it comes around, I'm going to do the same thing. Um, however, in the back of my mind, I'm going to have been you know, thinking about, I will be thinking about the lessons that I learned um, from this event. Um, you know, China just reopened, right? After three years of, of basically zero COVID policy. I bet in six weeks, COVID is going to disappear from the landscape in China, and China is going to come roaring back, right? There's going to be some interesting questions to be asked about that, right? Like, again, I, I, I don't want to go too deep into it because I, I'm not an expert and I'm just, just observing the same stuff as you did. How did India get through it without the vaccines? Like, one day India was all the news, and the next day India disappeared from the news. They have a billion people billion, two, billion, three people, right? I mean, um, and so when China gets through it, like, I don't know, like, it's, it, 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 there's just no question that the entire affair has caused a deep, you know, scar for many people in the country around trust of government, rightly or wrongly, it exists. And so rightly. to your <laughs> question, would I do it again? Yeah, I would, because look, I'm, I'm a defensive pessimist. I'm going to take care of my family. I'm going to take care of my friends. I'm going to take care of my loved ones, take care of my business partner, their family. I'm going to go into protect and preserve mode until we learn more. And so I, I keep going back to in January of 2020, business was booming for us. Everything was great. And I'm on Twitter watching these videos of people collapsing in the street. And I'm thinking, and then I'm looking on you know, uh, flightaware.com, and I'm seeing six flights a day from Shanghai to JFK and eight flights a day from Beijing to San Francisco. And I'm thinking, that's coming here. It's time to lock down, right? Now, I don't know who put those videos out and why they were, the Twitter algorithm decided to show them to me 24 hours a day in early January. But given that same fact set, probably not going to behave very differently. Um, you know, because ultimately, you know, the security of my family is viscerally very important to me. And that, that primal instinct, you know, the reptilian part of your brain is very difficult to turn off. And, um, and by the way, knowing me, the one time I turn it off, I would have been wrong and I would have been right to actually go into lockdown mode. And then I would feel terrible because, you know, we would, we would suffer uh, much worse consequences. Look, I'm very lucky. You're very lucky. Bob's very lucky. Like we, we could lock down. We have good lives. We live in the U.S. Um, our business bounced back. We reinvented ourselves. Um, our, my family never did without. Um, I, I could afford to buy six weeks worth of food and all the medicines we would need and all of that stuff. Like there are many, many people in the country and in the world that are nowhere near as privileged as we are and for whom this event was a true catastrophe. I feel very deep empathy for those people. Um, and so I don't want to like just sit here and say like, it, it, I am totally self-aware that I was in a financial position to absorb an 85% hit to my business. And my family saw basically no change in their standard of living and I bridged ourselves to the point where we could reinvent ourselves and create something as magical as Doomberg. Like what a country to live in, what a time to be alive, what, a, what an amazing place. There's still lots of very positive things going on here. But turning back the clock with that fact set, and as much as I love and care for my friends and family, I probably would do the same thing, total, total transparency. You know, it's interesting. I look at it in the context of, of relationships a lot of the time. Uh, somebody 
that I engage with on Twitter quite a bit said today on Twitter, and, and I replied to it, sometimes I can't help myself, said, so every single cardiac arrest is now the vaccine? You know, is that really the way we should do it? And my reply was, it reminds me of when someone you care about behaves in a shady fashion, and now everything that reminds you of that shady behavior, yeah, you, you think it's that shady behavior. Again, it's sort of like human nature, right? You were hurt by someone you trusted, and I'm referring more to the health apparatus and I'm including, well, I never really trusted the pharmaceutical companies, but just the general health apparatus, the, the you know, the health officials, you, the national health officials so, basically either were uneducated, lied, or, you know, the best of combination of both. And now every time something happens, you know, I would take the other side of that. Uh, I probably won't next time and I'll be hurt from it. Right. I mean, next time something so, happens, I'll probably, I'll probably say, say no, no, I'm not doing it. So I would say both of you um have a kernel of correctness in your mm -hmm. assessment you know like um elvis presley's daughter died of a heart attack overnight right and right the first thing everybody jumps to is you know right. when was she boosted right i mean let's just put it out there that's first thing i thought of first thing many people thought of and same thing with the buffalo bills football player everybody correct. right away wanted to know when he'd exactly. been boosted if he had exactly been boosted. now your friend has some justification for saying what they said Mm -hmm. which is heart attacks were the number one cause of death in the U.S. long before COVID was a thing and long before the vaccines were a thing. And we have to be careful to not jump to such conclusions. Um, again, went back to the whole original question. This is the most I've ever talked about the vaccine because nobody's ever asked me about it before. And uh, we've never written about it on purpose because I just don't know. And for me to take the time to go and study, to get the level of expertise, you know, I had... Um, I'm a PhD, worked in the commodity sector for 20 years. I led thousands of scientists working on all kinds of energy related uh, projects, renewable and, and, and fossil and otherwise, and uh, environmental abatements. And I've consulted in that space. I'm very comfortable talking in that space. And so talking about vaccines, I'm just giving you my visceral personal experience, not my expertise. And I want to be very clear that I have no strong opinions on the matter that I feel comfortable expressing as Doomberg or under the Doomberg brand. And if I, if I did, I would express them. And because I don't, I won't but I'm just giving you my personal view as a human. Yeah, I'd like you to critique me yeah. rather than- No, uh, no, no critique. Yeah. I, I'm sympathetic to your view in many ways. Look, I, if I, I mean, I, so the problem is like, um, you know, I, I immigrated to the US and when I became a citizen, I had to get all my vaccines updated and polio and the measles and the mumps and all of that stuff. And, and I, I'm a big believer that, um, that modern medicine has, has performed miracles for us. Like I, 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 I I don't want to wake up in the morning and be suspicious of the pharmaceutical industry. Um, I'm helping a dear relative with cancer for many years, and I've come to learn that the treatment of cancer is a very complex mix of ethics, science, and economics. And, and these questions are hard. Um, they're not easy. And I don't pretend to have the expertise to get to them, but I'm a human and I have the same feelings. And so like a bigger question would be, if I could do it over again, would I get the vaccine? You know, I, I wonder how many people would reconsider that. Um, I, I stopped getting boosted. Now, the flip side, I live in a home where my wife got boosted and so did my children. Um, and this, it's like, I don't feel so strongly about it that that was a, a line in the sand for me. I don't know. And like you say, I, like everybody else, have to trust the authorities. And to the extent that some of that trust has been eroded personally, um, I understand that. And I also understand how um, there's a whole swath of people that I love and respect that I have good friendships with that have a completely orthogonal view to me that has still have complete total trust in the government. Um, and, and I just accept that. I don't, you know, this is not an area where I have an expertise to get into the fray and to make a definitive stand. I can I only tell you how that. I feel. Yeah, I go ahead. No, but, but I, here's, here's a thing that like when I, we ask about the vaccine, like I'm not talking about breaking down the nuts and bolts of, medicinal efficacy whatever bullshit i'm talking about the fact that we can't that you cannot bring it up for fear of cancel all i'm i'm not talking about the vaccine i'm talking about talking about the vaccine and i'm not trying to sound like a politician here but we all agree yeah. that saying <laughs> wait does it does is their side effect is a perfectly reasonable conversation correct yes yeah, so i would say that separate from the vaccine the deeper political question of what social media puts in front of the average person and who gets to decide it is a very important one. And the vaccine, if nothing else, has brought that discussion to the forefront. And in a way, that's a very good thing. 
And as we watch the various Twitter files come out, the amount of government interference in social media is staggering. Uh, for whatever it is, whatever you think about Elon Musk, um, he is bringing to the forefront something that would have been called a conspiracy theory a year ago or two years ago. Um, and so at a minimum, the the word disinformation or misinformation is is a deeply offensive word. Like I'm capable, exactly. I believe, and most people are capable of of deciding what is propaganda and what is, you know, like just being on Twitter, sometimes you retweet something and you were fooled because somebody like posted an article that was, you know, two years old and you thought it was current and you got tricked. What do you do? You undo that retweet and you block the person who fooled you because they're not a a trustworthy source and because i'm and, so bad at that right it happens like you're human but you learn you train your algorithm your own personal algorithm back to the whole freedom point i don't need to be force-fed um what is the accepted truth hey, from government yeah hey guys i did not have any idea this was going to go on an hour i got to go on scott shelley's show in four minutes Doomer, this has been such an honor for me. Yeah. This has been, you've been amazing. This has been one of my favorite shows ever. I feel bad that I have to cut it short, but I had no idea that we'd talk no about it. No, I want to ask, on one, I want to ask one more question. Go ahead, Jimmy. You can, can you do it without me? Because they're calling is, me. Yeah, go ahead. This is just going to bring it back to energy and then I'll wrap it up. Awesome. Uh, Thanks, Jim. Yeah, good, so, luck on the, good luck on the show. So, Doomberg, I'm... The question I wanted to bring it back to, and I actually know your answer to this because I read it uh, um, in one of your Substack pieces. I don't remember the name of it. Can you go into real quick, and then we'll wrap it up, the, your view on electric cars versus internal combustion engines versus hybrids, and why? I'll just let you talk about it. Sure. We wrote, wrote that in a couple of pieces. Um, um, one is America's energy strategies, bonkers, and a and then another one I think was a a, um, a serious proposal on U.S. energy. Yeah, that's so the one at, I read. Yeah, that's at its read. at its core, um, the world faces a chronic shortage of the metals and materials that go into batteries: lithium, cobalt, and nickel. Given that constraint, I'm a constraints-based manager. When I was in the corporate world, I would spend all day thinking about what is the constraint to this project and how do I alleviate it. The constraint to the proliferation of batteries into vehicles is a shortage of mining materials, which is, of course, unironically made worse by environmentalists who are opposed to the siting and, and um, permitting and development of new mines. So given that axiom, we do not have enough battery materials. If your objective is to displace the maximum amount of fossil fuels burned in the transportation sector, given the constraint of battery materials, it necessitates that you should be for hybrid electric vehicles and not full battery electric vehicles. And let me just put some numbers around this. If I'm going to buy a full battery electric vehicle, me, Doomberg, I might get an 80 kilowatt hour battery pack inside a Tesla, an Audi e-tron, pick your favorite car. That 80 kilowatt hour battery pack abates 100% of my fossil fuel usage. That's great. We'll give that score of 100. Mm -hmm. If instead I divide that battery pack in four and I put four 20 kilowatt hour battery packs in plug-in hybrids and I give one to me and to Bob and to Jim and we'll pick a, out of a hat a lottery winner from one of the listeners and they'll get a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle too we will abate 90% of our fossil fuel usage because most of the time you don't drive more than 40 miles in a day. A 20 kilowatt hour battery pack could get you probably around 40 miles of regular driving. Then the engine kicks in. And so if I can abate four people's fossil fuel usage to the tune of 90%, that's a score of 360. See, so one person's full or four people's 90%. 360 is a bigger number than 100. It's so almost so four times the normal or what you correct. would make from an electric vehicle. 3.6, plus or minus, pick your favorite. Sure. Um, and so if battery materials are the constraint, we must manage to that constraint. And in fact, to take it further, the Toyota Prius has done more to abate fossil fuel usage than any other vehicle on the planet. It has a very small battery in it, um, and it shaves off the portions of the drive of an internal combustion engine that are the least efficient. 
it leans on the battery during those times. And it gets 45, 50 miles per gallon. If you took the, and that, I don't know how big the battery is in the Prius, but I'm guessing it's no bigger than four kilowatt hours. Mm -hmm. So that one, and I'm rounding up. So, you know, I'm sure somebody will Google and tell me that I'm wrong, but you get the point. Let's just say it's four for the sake of argument. Sure. Um, for that one 80 kilowatt hour battery pack, you get 20 Priuses or 20 regular hybrids. Um, and so if you cut everybody's fossil fuel uses in half, you know, 20 times 50 is a thousand. <laughs> and so like to concentrate that amount of battery materials, which are in chronically short supply in the hands of a relatively small amount of vanity cars does less than nothing for the environment. And it's a true test of seriousness for us. Um, governments around the world are violently against plug-in hybrids and are focusing exclusively on battery electric vehicles, which immediately tells us that they're deeply unserious about actually addressing the problem. Because as we've seen, the price of cobalt has skyrocketed, the price of nickel has skyrocketed, the price of lithium has skyrocketed, which is inevitable because these things are highly inelastic. Um, Apple really wants those materials for their phones um, and for their iPads and for their MacBooks and, and pick your favorite Google for the Android. Um, and so when you are sort of short, highly elastic materials, the market clearing price can be much higher than you think, which is why the price of lithium is up by a factor of 10 or 20 in the past 18 months. Um, this is going to constrain the affordability of electric vehicles. And if you continue to ignore the constraint, the constraint will punch you in the face. And it's going to happen. There is not enough battery materials to electrify the, the fleet with BEVs. Um, the, the, the Toyota Prius model um, proves it. Toyota is incredibly prudent and prescient on environmental issues and a company that I deeply admire. And um, if you don't manage the constraint, the constraint will punch in the face. And in, and in, the, BE, in the electric vehicle space, the constraint is batteries, full stop. And everybody in the space knows it. Um, everybody's just kind of like pretending like it's not going to bite us this year, so we'll keep going. But um, that's the constraint. And if we don't manage to it, we're done. Well, I got to tell people before we wrap this up that that was the article um, that made me just basically a permanent fan because one of the things I like that you do, and then I'll let you go, and I appreciate your time, is you use the word unserious because I'm always fighting internally as to whether it's just stupidity or whether it's nefarious and it's contempt. And um, I, I, I like unserious because I think that kind of encompasses the possibility of both uh, in your wording. So I really appreciate it. Doomberg, thank you so much for anybody who needs to find you, wants to find you. How do they find you? We are, all of our work is published at doomberg.substack.com. We are 100% subscriber supported. We do not accept ads or sponsorships. And we always say there's nothing wrong with those business models, but for us, it doesn't work. Uh, we pride ourselves on being as provocative as we would like to be, as we feel we need to be. And we're not beholden to sponsors or advertisers. We're not worried about what we write. Uh, and pressing send to our subscribers. Our subscribers know they're getting our full authentic uh, beliefs in every piece that we write and willing to correct those beliefs when we're wrong. And we have done so in several pieces. Um, um, free subscribers get pretty extensive previews of our pieces. And then um, to read the full piece, you sort of have to be a paid subscriber. That's that's the balance of, of being uh, sort of listener supported or reader supported uh, business. Uh, we are uh, the number one finance substack in the world, which is truly amazing, humbling. Um, stunning, uh, but at the same time, it shows you that if you are willing to make cohesive arguments patiently, politely, that people are willing to be open-minded and to, um, to perhaps change their minds on things. And then that's actually a pretty hopeful sign for us that we have been able to carve out this audience by being as honest and scientific and true to our values as we have been, and we will continue to be. It's the work of my life. It's the work of our lives. Um, and thank you, um, Bob, and, and give my thanks to Jim for having me on. It was a great discussion, and I really appreciated it. I will. I appreciate it. And I want to make, you know, full disclosure, I'm a paid subscriber, and I will get not one red cent. If you subscribe to Doomberg, I'm still recommending it. So uh, I will, though. I'll get all the cents. So <laughs> please, the cents. please go ahead and subscribe. I'm, I'm no, unabashedly a catalyst. Honestly, <laughs> if you're serious about learning about these subjects at all, you need to be a subscriber, even if it's just for a short period of time. But, dude, thank you so much for your time, man. We really appreciate it. Thank you, sir. Cheers. Cool. All right. Let me know when it's out and uh, we'll, we'll put it through Twitter. And I had a, I had a real good time. Uh, yeah, I appreciate it, man. It'll either be out Sunday or Monday, more likely Sunday since we're doing it on Thursday or uh, cool. early on Friday. All right, brother. Talk to you soon. Give my message to Jim. Talk to you soon, man. We'll do. Bye. Cheers.